videos on nurse teaching, patient teaching as well as health education and this qualifies as a patient education plus health education video because I'm going to be discussing gestational trophoblastic diseases or GTD so stay tuned and let's learn together. If this is your first time here please take your time to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload an informative video such as this one. So these are tumors and neoplasm that are rare but highly curable diseases arising from the product of conception in the uterus. They result from abnormal fertilization and are divided into distinct clinical pathologic entities. One, hydatidiform mole, partial or complete. Another name for hydatidiform mole is molar pregnancy. So I will be discussing a little bit briefly about the hydatidiform mole because we have a number of people who get this condition but they are not aware how serious or what it actually is and therefore this I got you covered and I will provide a bit more information about hydrated form mole. Then we have invasive mole and then we have number three gestational trophoblastic neoplasia such as choriocarcinoma, placentocyte trophoblastic tumor and epithelioid trophoblastic tumor. Broadly these tumors represent less than 1% of all tumors, though there, are no clear, there is no clear local data locally here in Kenya, but we have a bit of this. We have seen such conditions and we have uh, in my unit, which is an oncology unit, we have seen a number of patients getting treatment for these GTDs. The most common risk factor is a molar pregnancy and they can also complicate normal or ectopic pregnancies and spontaneous or induced abortions. To discuss further about molar, molar pregnancy, this is an abnormal form of pregnancy in which a non-viable fertilized egg implants in the uterus and will fail to come to term. So there is no fetus, it's just an, when it is complete, or complete molar pregnancy, there is no fetus, there is no placenta. It's just a non-viable fertilized egg that has implanted in the uterus and this is also known as hydatid form mole, which I had said earlier. A molar pregnancy is a gestational trophoblastic disease which grows into a mass in the uterus that has swollen chorionic villi. These villi grow in clusters that resemble grapes. So if I will show you a picture in the next slide that will help you appreciate what I'm talking about. There are two types of molar pregnancy. And one is complete molar pregnancy and partial molar pregnancy. In complete molar pregnancy, the placental tissue is abnormal and swollen and appears to form fluid-filled cysts. There is no formation of fetal tissue in this case. In partial molar pregnancy, there may be normal placenta tissue along with the abnormality forming placenta tissue. There may be also formation of a fetus, but the fetus may not be able to survive and is really miscarried early in the pregnancy. What we have here is an example or a display of a molar pregnancy. You can see the normal uterus and you can see the uterus that has molar pregnancy in it. So there is no fetus in this. We are just seeing things that look like bubbles and usually they look like, uh, formally it looks like red gelatinous bubbles. Uh, like you can see or like grapes. You can see that shape and they are small but very mini. So somebody may assume they are actually pregnant and they will feel pregnant but there is no viable fetus in that pregnancy. 
For visual clarity, this is gestational trophoblastic disease and it can be benign where we just have the moles or the hydrated deform moles. Uh, you can see how, how it looks like the grapes that are dissolved in some gel. And then we have invasive moles uh, that now seem to be encroaching on the uterine uh, muscles. And on that side, we are going to be talking about malignant disease. Then we have choriocarcinoma, which from the picture you can appreciate, it looks totally different. And you can already see that the uterine muscles, the, um, the tissues that form the uterine cavity have been invaded and there's something that is growing. And that is the cancer that we are talking about. And this is choriocarcinoma in that case. So in this diagram, we have a differentiation of different types of these GTDs or gestational trophoblastic neoplasias. The first one shows a complete hydatidiform mole. The second one shows a partial hydatidiform mole where we have a baby and a, uh, a placenta, but then you can already see the moles that have formed on the uterine side uh, where we have the placenta. Then we have coexistent mole and live fetus that is a scenario that could happen where we just have healthy enough tissue to form a fetus as well as a healthy placenta as well as on the other side we have a live no co coexistent mole on that other side that you can see in the third diagram then in the fourth diagram we have invasive mole that we can see now the moles are just encroaching on the fundus and on the sides of the uterine cavity on the endometrium and this is disease and you can see how it goes. Then we have choriocarcinoma which has gone and um, from the picture there it has already even gone to the lungs uh, so there is metastasis. Then we have placentocyte trophoblastic tumor and this is where usually the placenta will have attached itself and you can already see disease in that area or the moles around the placentocyte area. So, so classification of gestational trophoblastic diseases, we have those that are benign or uh, going all the way to those that are malignant and metastatic. And usually we have partial mole or complete mole, usually benign gestational trophoblastic disease. And when we have this being persistent, it could lead to malignant gestational trophoblastic diseases. Um, then on the other side where we have the neoplasias, we have invasive moles, choriocarcinoma and placenta site trophoblastic tumor. These are malignant and they can either be non-metastatic, just meaning they are just confined in the uterus as well as they could be metastatic but low risk or high risk. So treatment, it is important to know, to remember this classification because this is classification according to the World Health Organization and this is called FIGO classification. Uh, if you Google it, you're going to see that whole classification and how they arrived at this, but it is important to know whether the disease is metastatic or not and whether it is high risk or low risk. So usually women with GTD may present with pelvic pain or cessation of sensation of pressure, anemia, hyperemesis, gravidarum, hyperthyroidism, and preeclampsia in early pregnancy. However, abnormal and excessive vaginal bleeding is the commonest mode of presentation. Other symptoms and signs depend on the site of metastasis, for example, in the lungs, liver, and brain. Examination include speculum pelvic examination, which may show vaginal deposits. Further diagnostic workup includes laboratory estimation of UHCG HCG in urine and or blood, pelvic ultrasound, chest x-ray, chest and brain CT scan or MRI are of value as well. Imaging modalities are primarily used for the evaluation of metastatic disease. When it comes to staging and risk management, it is important to remember that stage 1 tumor is confined in the uterus while stage 2 tumor is extending to the adnexa or the vagina but is limited to the genital structures. That is the adnexa, the vagina and the broad ligament. Then stage 3 we have tumor extending to the lungs with or without known genital tract involvement. And finally stage 4 we have all other metastatic sites. Uh, but we know the origin started from the uterine cavity. So 
again from the WHO figure risk factor prognostic scoring, uh, there is a staging for the same. And the, this is a prognostic scoring for GTN. And this was done in the year 2000. Uh, we start with age in years. If the patient is below 40 years, that is figure scoring zero. If they are above 40, that is stage one. Antecedent pregnancy and there was a mole and then that will be zero. But if uh, there was an abortion and then there was term, then those will go to one, two, three. So then uh, if the total score is less than six or up to six, then that is low risk. That's 100% low risk. While anything above seven is considered high risk according to this figure st staging uh, by WHO. So why this information is important is when we are going to be doing treatment because treatment will be based on what, whether it is metastatic, whether it is low risk, whether it is high risk, whether the disease is only in the uterine, uterine cavity or not. So management of hydrated foam wall. Suction curettage is a standard treatment. Sharp curettage two weeks later is then done for histopathological diagnosis. Provide combined oral contraceptive pill for at least one year post-treatment and monitor serum HCG levels monthly until three negative values. In special occasions, serum HCG levels will be monitored weekly until a normal serum HCG level is obtained and then followed up monthly to ensure at least three negative values. Hysterectomy is an alternative in special cases that should be decided and discussed with the patient by the gynecologist and the oncologist on board. And this should only be done if the patient uh, is interested in that procedure. Administer anti-D after uterine evacuation if the mother is recess negative. Management of choriocarcinoma. This requires one to perform pretreatment laboratory workup that includes a complete blood count, kidney function test, as well as liver function test. For non metastatic disease or figure stage one and low risk metastatic disease, figure stages two and three of score below six or zero to six, use single agent chemotherapy such as methotrexate or actinomycin D. Hysterectomy may be indicated in the presence of persistent heavy bleeding or when fertility is not desired. For high-risk metastatic disease, that is figure stage 3 and 4 or anything of a or figure score above 7, um, a combination of etoposide, methotrexate, actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide, and vincristine in a protocol called EMACO is used. For refractory disease, this means that disease was there, then it was treated and went away and then has come back. Uh, second line chemotherapy with cisplatin, replacing uh, vincristine in that combination I mentioned above is recommended. However, some oncologists prefer use of taxane such as paclitaxel uh, in the combination and eliminating vincristine as well, and that is found very helpful. The role of surgery in metastatic GTD lies mainly in the control of complications that result from the disease or chemotherapy such as hemorrhage or infection. So follow-up. Follow-up identifies women who may relapse or develop early menopause or secondary cancer. So monitor serum HCG levels monthly and three, three negative results. Beside clinical examination, all patients should have weekly HCG estimation until the levels return to normal, as I had mentioned earlier. Thereafter, HSG estimation is done monthly, and in low-risk disease, this is carried out for a whole year. In high-risk patients, this should be performed at least for two years, so continuously monthly until two years are done to ensure that disease hasn't come back or is not coming back. During this period of monitoring, it is important to prescribe effective contraception, especially combined oral contraceptive pill. Commonly used medications to treat hydrated foam mold on these GTDs include methotrexate, tetroposide, actimonomycin, cisplatin, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, and doxorubicin. The first line treatment in low risk disease is methotrexate monotherapy. In high risk disease, is a combination of metoposide, methotrexate, actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide, and vincristine in a combination called or a protocol called EMACO. 
the prognosis of, for cure is usually good even when the disease has metastasis. So do not give up hope if you are told you have metastasis because it is possible to cure or get near to normal life expectancy even with these diseases. Thank you so much for watching through this video. The references provided here were used to develop this video and a lot more of online reading. Um, uh, you can also follow and read through the National Treatment Cancer Treatment Guidelines in Kenya that was adapted in 2013 and the protocols that were developed in 2019 because both were helpful while preparing this video.